go ahead. All right, okay. Um, I'm Wei Liao, and I teach at Monterey Institute of International Studies uh, in California, uh, in the United States. Um, first, of course, I also want to thank um, the conference organizer, especially at Brown, for inviting me to the uh, symposium. It's my first time in Brazil, so I'm very excited. And, uh, um, Um, today, I'm going to talk about the role played by China in uh, global economic governance and I use the World Trade Organization and the, the G20 as uh, the two case studies. Um, uh, the recent financial crisis, uh, I think, uh, has taught us a lesson which is that it highlighted uh, the um, importance or the greater need for international co cooperation, but also it has demonstrated that the, the existing global architecture is inadequate. And uh, within this context, uh, uh, two particular uh, changes we want to uh, pay attention to. One is that the uh, most of the current, uh, the existing uh, global economic governance institutions were created back in the 1940s after uh, the Bretton Woods system after the end of the Second World War. So um, at that time, uh, the world was different from today. And the uh, one thing is that uh, at that time, the US and the, uh, the West European countries were the dominant powers. But today, we have seen the rising importance of the emerging uh, economies. And uh, um, the other thing is that globalization in the last uh, 20, 30 years has completely changed uh, the global economy uh, in a more fundamental way. So today we live in an interdependent world. And not only we're talking about the flow of goods, capital, services, and uh, also people. So um, within this uh, context, here are my two research questions of the paper. One is, I want to look at uh, China's emergence economic, as an economic power uh, has a direct impact on other developing countries. Uh, because if we think about 30 years ago, before China opened the uh, um, door, uh, start, before China started its economic reform, China was a very isolated economy. At that time, the whole country only had 12 state-owned trading companies, and those 12 companies were in charge of foreign trade. But of course, it's no longer the case today. But then the question is, if uh, China has today become so uh, integrated into uh, the world economy, then uh, would, what kind of impact? Is it going to be largely positive or negative to other developing countries. And for uh, the purpose of my paper, of course, my focus is on other um, four BRICS countries. And the second question is to look at uh, uh, a puzzle to me, which is that if we, if we think about today, uh, China is already the second largest economy in terms of uh, the GDP and also uh, specifically in trade area, China is already the, uh, the largest trading country in the world surpassed uh, the U.S. last year if we look at the combined export and the import. And, uh, but if we break down the export and import, China is the largest uh, exporting country and the second largest uh, uh, importing country. But if you look at the China's participation in the World Trade Organization or uh, in the G20, um, it has been, uh, well, on the one hand, we can say China has tried to keep a very low profile position. But on the other hand, if we uh, look at the effectiveness of China's participation, it's, uh, uh, um, China's not getting there yet. Especially if we do a comparison between uh, China's participation and the Brazilian and the um, Indians uh, in the same organization, the World Trade Organization, the G20. Then, um, here is the outline. Um, I will skip this part. Just to give you a, a rough picture, when I say China is a, a, the, already the largest trading country, I mean that uh, to many countries, China is already their top uh, trading partners. 
and uh, among the BRICS countries, I, I think I forgot Russia there, South Africa, Brazil, and Russia, um, China is their largest trading partner, but for India, China is the second largest uh, trading, trading partner. And all this has happened uh, if we look at the, uh, the role and the position of China in this global trade, which is that China, different from most uh, uh, many other developing countries, China developed its comparative advantage in manufacturing and uh, specifically on um, processing trade. Processing trade means that China has to import a lot of things, commodities, energy, uh, uh, parts, and uh, all those will be assembled in China and put a label made in China and it will be exported to the global market. And uh, if uh, we look at uh, what I highlighted in the red ink, uh, uh, manufactured goods accounted for 90% of China's exports and uh, over 72% of China's imports. And uh, uh, if we look at between 1998 to 2008, there has been a very uh, visible change in China's trade, which is that China has, uh, for both exports and imports, China has diversified away from the, the traditional uh, developed economies but trying to trade more with the emerging developing countries. And another very interesting uh, way to look at China's trend is that over the years, if we use 2000 as a base year and we uh, put the 2000 as 100, then we can look at over the years, in the last 10 years, the terms of trade for China has deteriorated. And if we look at for other developing countries, because of their increasing trade with China, uh, many countries, their terms of trade actually improved. And uh, those countries are usually the countries either they produce the components and uh, some assemblies for the processing in China or they provide the, um, the primary commodities. And uh, in the last 10 years, what we have seen is the sharp increase of uh, commodity prices. And of course, the, the third category of the developing countries are those who uh, have uh, provided the capital goods uh, to China. And they have benefited a lot from trading with China. But uh, the, on the other hand, uh, increasing trade with China has uh, brought lots of challenges to those developing countries. First one is the competition in the third market. And uh, um, as we know, um, Chinese goods are are uh, known for reasonably good quality, but absolutely low price. So um, this China price has really undercut uh, the uh, competition, not only in the third market, but also even uh, in the home market of many developing countries. We have uh, heard lots of criticism or the worries or the policy concerns about the deindustrialization and also the com uh, competing FDIs because in the last 30 years, China has been consistently the largest recipient of FDI among all the uh, developing countries, which also means that for uh, many other developing countries, they have faced the pressure. And uh, just to uh, use as an example, one is India's uh, merchandise trade with China. If we uh, look at uh, um, this figure, it clearly shows that for every dollar uh, India exports to China, uh, India has to import three dollars back. So the current trade deficit for India is already $40 billion, and that has been a very big issue, and that has spurred protectionism uh, yes. back in India. Similarly, if we look at the uh, Brazilian exports, here, uh, presents another type of the challenge, which is the industrialization. Clearly, it shows that the last uh, 10 years, uh, because of increasing trade with uh, China, uh, of course, uh, Brazil doesn't have this trade deficit uh, issue, but the problem is increasing primary goods exports has uh, really uh, become an issue because uh, uh, 
for most of the developing countries, um, the, uh, the policy priority has always been trying to industrialize. <coughs> and uh, uh, also, uh, as a result of all this, uh, of China's emergence, and also because China has been part of this global production network, and we have seen the increasing trade frictions, not only between China and the developed economies, but increasingly between China and uh, uh, developing countries, primarily the other four uh, works countries. And uh, uh, just use as an example the last 10, year, the 10 years uh, over the period from uh, 2001 to 2011, India initiated 147 anti-dumping cases against China, of which uh, 120 ended with affirmative rulings, which means that the, uh, the dumping duties have been imposed. Then within this context, uh, I want to look at the issue of uh, um, China in the global economic governance. What is in the WTO? How do we measure effective participation of China? Well, of course, we look at the compliance. And as I just mentioned, China is the uh, most frequent target of trade disputes. And uh, China has been uh, brought to the WTO dispute settlement um, more frequently than any other uh, WTO members. So that is one way to look at China's participation. And the other way is really to look at, uh, uh, in terms of the uh, responsibility, but also in terms of uh, being an important stakeholder, uh, is China now part of this rulemaking uh, circle of the WTO as we uh, all realize the importance of this participation is that the emerging economies today, they have gained economic clout, but they haven't gained this uh, political influence uh, in global governance. And uh, one way to look at the uh, political influence in the governance, uh, global governance, is uh, what is your power and what is your leverage to set the agenda to influence other countries, to persuade other members to make the concessions that will benefit uh, your uh, national interests. But if we look at uh, the case of China, uh, the, uh, China has not been there yet. And uh, then um, specifically the Doha Round negotiation, uh, this is a really bad idea of uh, having uh, on the one hand, you know, the formal principle of